is Swati Sathe. I'm a neurologist and the medical director for CHDI Management and CHDI Foundation. CHDI Foundation is a nonprofit biomedical research organization dedicated to research in Huntington disease. The mission of the organization is to accelerate drug development and curative therapies for Huntington disease through every avenue possible, whether it is preclinical, translational, or clinical. And we'll start with a little bit of background of uh, Huntington disease and the trinucleotide repeat disorders. So Huntington disease can be considered as a prototypic uh, trinucleotide repeat disorder. The human genome contains short tandem repeats of uh, nucleotides, uh, and these are distributed throughout the genome. However, these tandem repeats are susceptible to expansion uh, over generations uh, due to several uh, mechanisms involved. Uh, but in the physiologic state or in individuals with normal number of these repeats, these repeats are num usually short uh, and they are uh, herited uh, in a similar manner. In certain individuals, these repeats may be expanded to something called as premutation, where they are neither uh, small enough to be considered normal or physiologic, neither are they large enough to be considered pathogenic. These individuals may be phenotypically normal, but they have a propensity to transmit a larger expanded repeat to the next generation. That lies the molecular mechanism, there lies the molecular mechanism behind uh, repeat disorders. Now, all repeat disorders need not be trinucleotide repeats. There are uh, tetranucleotide repeats, pentanucleotide repeats, even decanucleotide repeat disorders described. And the diagram below shows the 30-odd uh, uh, repeat disorders that are known uh, in, the, in humans and the locations of all these repeat disorders. Now, we can see that the repeats may be in the coding region of the gene or the non-coding region of the gene. They may even be in the promoter region of the gene. Each of these locations where the repeat occurs also has certain characteristics pertaining to that disease. So for example, if it's in the non-coding region, uh, then uh, the number of repeats required uh, for, for the expansion to become pathogenic may be different. Um, or the mechanism behind how each of these repeats may cause uh, it, a particular disease or sickness may be different. So if they're in the five dash non-translated region, then the mechanism might be that there is, uh, it's a loss of function mechanism where the protein is not produced. Whereas if they lie in the coding region, just like all the CAG repeat disorders, then the mechanism of action is usually toxic gain of function where the protein is causing abnormal functioning because of this expanded repeats. The um, the, the, the kind of repeat will also determine the nature of the uh, disorder. So the polyalanine disorders, for example, almost all of them, maybe barring one, are actually developmental disorders, uh, whereas the uh, trinucleotide repeat disorders, all of them are neurodegenerative diseases. So depending on where the repeat occurs and what sort of a repeat it is, uh, determines the nature of the uh, uh, disorder that may be caused. Now, if you focus on the polyglutamine neurodegenerative diseases, of which Huntington is a prototypic uh, disease, uh, the expansion is within the coding region. And this expansion of the poly uh, CAG repeat causes a polyglutamine chain in, to be translated into the protein. So the protein is formed with this abnormal repeats of polyglutamine. And as we said, the expression of disease is through toxic gain of function. These mutant proteins accumulate inside neurons. They could be in the nucleus or in the cytoplasm, depending on the disease. But the accumulation of these aggregates of neurons forms the hallmark of uh, the polyglutamine diseases. However, it is not clear whether these aggregates or precipitation of these aggregates is necessarily pathogenic. Uh, in some hold the belief that it even may be a protective phenomena. And therefore, though they are the hallmark of the disease, it is not completely clear if they are involved directly in pathogenesis or they are just a biphenomena of the uh, of the pathogenic process. The disorders are usually adult onset, the polyglutamine neurodegenerative diseases. They are relentlessly progressive, usually causing significant disability and invariably being the cause of death in most of the circumstances. Now, if we focus on Huntington disease, 
This was uh, described uh, by the end of the 19th century by George Huntington. Uh, his grandfather and his father were involved in taking care of uh, patients and families with Huntington disease on La Long Island in New York. Uh, and his report is considered to be very succinct and descriptive of the disorder as we know it. Um, it described the abnormal movement and the psychological disturbance. And we have come a long way, of course, from there, but this was the original description of Huntington disease. Uh, the, all polyglutamine disorders are autosomal dominant in nature. Uh, as we said, there is a certain number of repeats of the CAG that is considered normal. And in case of Huntington disease, the normal repeats are less than 26. So in, in a unaffected individual, both alleles of the Huntington gene on chromosome four will carry more, less than 26 CAG repeats in axon one of the Huntington gene. In a pre-mutation state, usually uh, the number expanded uh, of the CAG repeats is to about 27 to 35. These individuals are not expected to develop any pathology. However, this repeat becomes un unstable at this point and the possibility of transmitting an expanded repeat to the next generation becomes higher. In case of Huntington disease, if the transmitting, father, if the transmitting parent is the father, then the possibility of transmission is higher. Uh, when the repeat number is between 36 and 39, uh, we, there is an incomplete penetrance, meaning it, it is not necessary that every individual who carries a CAG expansion between 36 and 39 will develop a disease in their lifetime. Uh, some of them will and some of them won't. Usually it is a late onset disease. However, repeats beyond 40 are considered to be pathogenic, meaning that almost all individuals who have repeats beyond 40 will manifest uh, symptoms and signs of Huntington disease in their lifetime. The length of the CAG repeat is inversely proportional to the age of onset of all symptoms and especially motor symptoms. So the clinical characteristics of the disease can be um, grouped as psychologic, uh, behavior, motor, and cognitive. The description or the, the current um, stratification of the disease is such that uh, the disease is classified as pre-manifest and manifest. The disease is considered manifest when the patient or uh, the individual has motor symptoms that are considered to be characteristic and conclusive of Huntington disease by a clinician. Now, this definition is more used for research purposes and for um, classification purposes. In real life, uh, the situation may be different, especially for individuals who have family history of Huntington disease, then the family and the patient themselves can recognize symptoms of Huntington disease way before motor onset. The initial symptoms are usually psychological, uh, apathy, irritability, depression, anxiety, obsessive compulsive behaviors. These are one of the prime uh, psychological phenomena. They occur up to one to two de decades prior to the motor onset. These symptoms are usually inter inter intermittent and um, uh, they get, usually get treated uh, for these symptoms. The behavioral symptoms uh, relate to the psychological uh, disturbances and are usually characterized by irritability or aggression uh, or mood changes. The motor symptoms, an average onset of motor symptoms is in the early 40s, if you average out all the CAG lengths. The classic hallmark presentation is with chorea. Uh, it, these are distal involuntary movements and initially, uh, there is an attempt by the person to make them up, appear at least semi-voluntary, where a, in, even when the involuntary movement begins, the patients themselves may complete the movement as if, as if to make it uh, seem voluntary. However, these movements are relentlessly progressive and they become uh, more, they become larger in amplitude uh, and more distributed uh, in the uh, extremities. Uh, as well as the neck muscles, face muscles, and so on, uh, to the point that they usually become disabling, start interfering with function, uh, and are easily noticeable by uh, everybody around the patient. The um, movement disorder does change over time. Eventually, patients do get bradykinesia, gait uh, disability, and other movement disorders uh, along with the chorea. Invariably, this leads to a bed-bound state in the, in the uh, eventual stages of the disease. Uh, 
the cognitive disorder is almost simultaneous onset with the motor disorder. The dementia is more that of an executive dysfunction uh, where there's lack of emotional recognition, uh, visual spatial disturbances, uh, lack of organizational skills, and executive dysfunction. The first functional decline may be considered as a change in the occupation or change in the um, type of work the person was accustomed to do prior to the onset of symptoms and that usually progresses to being increasingly dependent on the family members for activities of daily living and eventually dependent for complete care. Uh, there is no approved therapy uh, for Huntington disease. Usually the um, duration of disease is about 15 to 20 years beyond the motor onset of disease. As we said before, the longer the CAG repeat, earlier is the uh, age of onset of symptoms. Thus far, we have not had any approved uh, disease-modifying therapies. However, there is a phase three trial on, ongoing with an antisense oligonucleotide, and recently a gene therapy was initiated uh, as a cure for Huntington disease, and we will see what comes out of those, stu of those studies. Uh, just to go over the pathogenesis uh, a little bit, the first picture here shows the molecular uh, biology of Huntington disease. Uh, on the top, we can see a normal um, chromosome or a normal piece of DNA uh, with under 65 repeats. And the red beads on the protein chain show the CAG expansion translated to the glutamine chain. And that translates to a healthy neuron uh, being able to function normally. However, as the length of CAG repeats increases, as in the bottom panel, the polyglutamine chain gets longer and that translates into neuronal degeneration. Now, we do not exactly know how the translated polyglutamine chain translates to a neuronal dysfunction. Of course, there are several um, theories and several supporting uh, evidence of what exactly might be the mechanism. Uh, we know that a part of the uh, uh, Huntington protein uh, it do, does undergo post translation modifications and then. Uh, even further processing and a, a part of the protein enters the nucleus where it has roles in transcription. Um, however, with the expanded polyglutamine chain, it forms aggregates within the nucleus of this, this part of the protein. It also causes uh, transcriptional dysregulation, forms aggregates, uh, there's oligomerization of the uh, protein chain. The, the part of the protein that remains in the cytoplasm also undergoes aggregates. It causes uh, proteostasis and eventual dysfunction in axonal transport, synaptic uh, transmission, and mito mitochondrial function. It, there is also the uh, part of the protein chain with just the uh, exon 1 being translated, and that species of protein is also expected to cause some cytotoxicity. But how the exact mechanism behind this is still being deciphered. Now, in addition to this, there is selective vulnerability of the medium spiny neurons of the basal ganglia to uh, the toxicity of this abnormal protein. And the second figure here shows the different regions that are predominantly affected, but the medium spiny neurons are the most vulnerable set of neurons. There is also a chronology to how they get affected. In the initial part of the disease, the, the uh, medium spiny neurons of the indirect pathway are affected more, and that leads to the more hyperkinetic Coria-like syndrome, whereas in the later part of the disease, the, the direct pathway gets affected, and that translates into more a bradykinetic uh, rigid type of a syndrome, and that is what we see uh, clinically. Uh, along with that, there is atrophy of the cortex, um, uh, specific regions of the cortex, mostly the frontal cortex. The pathologic changes of the aggregates may also be seen in other parts of the brain, such as the thalamus and the cerebellum. However, the dysfunction of these, organ of these organelles within the brain is not equal to that of basal ganglia and the cortex. Grossly, uh, this leads to an atrophy uh, of the basal ganglia. And as you can see on the right panel of this uh, brain slice, as compared to the left side, there is extreme dilatation of the ventricles, almost loss of the caudate nucleus. Uh, and the uh, putamen. And this is a very hallmark slide or a hallmark patho pathologic phenomena with Huntington's disease. This is almost um, ubiquitously present in most uh, tests related to neurology and very hallmark sign even on MRI um, where Huntington patients can be picked up by relatively unsuspecting neuroradiologists 
as an incidental finding. Now, as we were talking about the stages of Huntington disease, this is a relatively complicated slide, but it um, it, it really gives the whole gamut of uh, the Huntington phenomena uh, that lasts over the entire life. And uh, it correlates the clinical phenomena with what, what is happening with the patient in the personal life. So if we start with the uh, most bottom panel, we can see that the neuronal aggregates and neuropathology probably precedes any of the clinical events uh, or the social events that are happening in the patient's life. This is followed by neuronal dysfunction and neuronal death. Uh, what's happening uh, clinically, uh, if you see in the middle panel, that we start seeing some milder symptoms of uh, Huntington and almost coinciding with the neuronal dysfunction, the uh, presentation of the neurological symptoms begins to escalate. Uh, whereas, whereas in the social life of the uh, uh, patient, usually what's happening is that when the patient themselves are unaffected or unaware of the disease status, their parent usually gets diagnosed and they realize that they're at an at-risk at status. As we said before, because other family members may have been affected, the recognition of symptoms uh, in other family members is very early in most genetic disorders, and that's what happens. And at some point, the patient gets diagnosed with Huntington disease. And as the patient himself is entering into a phase of disability or maybe loss of job and so on, um, the affected parent usually succumbs to the disease and leaves behind a trail of uh, relentless progression uh, for the patient. These are very difficult for the patient. These stages are very difficult for the patient and the patient's family. Uh, Huntington by far is a, a family illness, uh, way more than just the patient are involved in uh, psycho psychological, uh, financial, physical, uh, all aspects of the disease. And this very prolonged stage of 15 to 20 years of relentless progression is very, very difficult for the family members to witness. Now, depend, for the genetic testing, if the patient gets tested prior to any onset of symptoms, we will call it pre-symptomatic testing. This is offered for um, uh, patients at risk if they have family history of Huntington disease. This testing has to be done very carefully. Usually there are uh, at least two rounds of uh, genetic counseling that occur before the patient's uh, blood test is sent off. Uh, the uh, geneticist or the genetic counselor uh, usually counsels the patient about uh, what happens if the disease is positive, tries to understand the uh, position behind why the, a particular patient might want to get tested. And um, it, that, that, that in itself is a uh, drawn and a very um, serious process of getting tested for an autosomal dominant neurodegenerative disease. If you are testing the patient once they had had symptoms, then that becomes confirmatory testing. The pre-symptomatic testing uh, usually is pursued because people want to make decisions about getting married or uh, about having children, about their career, about their finance, and so on. Um, and that's usually a justification for why uh, they would get tested so that they can plan accordingly. Now, there are two stages uh, where suicidal ideation may be very high in Huntington disease. Huntington disease is known for uh, higher uh, suicidal rates, um, and the suicidal ideation is really high at the time when the patients get testing on a pre-symptomatic basis and the test gets positive. Because of that, uh, as we said, the genetic counseling is very important uh, in the process of pre-symptomatic testing. Um, once they have bypassed that uh, stage and they have been adequately counseled, the second rise in suicidal tendencies is at the time when the patient is losing their independence and starting to get dependent on the family for their activities of daily living.